George Brisker, uh, and this presentation is uh, part of a series of presentations in which we are looking at basic concepts in uh, semantic data and formal ontology. And this presentation will be looking at the concept of and the strategies behind doing a mapping to an ontology and using particularly CDOC CRM, uh, the ISO Standard Cultural Heritage Ontology, uh, for an example. So your takeaway from this video should be uh, a better idea of what you need to know and what it would mean to do a mapping uh, of your data to an ontology. So in this uh, small presentation, we're going to look at uh, a number of uh, features, uh, what you need to do to prepare to do a mapping, uh, methods, suggest methods for how to pull out, uh, pull, uh, make happen a mapping, uh, a bit of a recipe that you can try to follow uh, to uh, do your first mappings uh, and then I'll give an example uh, to illustrate how this would actually happen. So let's start by looking at uh, mapping prerequisites. The first thing would be to know what mapping means. Uh, so mapping doesn't have anything to do with uh, maps of the world. Uh, we're talking about doing a translation uh, from one data structure to another data structure and usually that translation means that you're translating from a particular data structure to a more general, more standardized data structure. It could be uh, just a standard schema or it could be uh, a full-on ontology. This translation provides systematic rules uh, to transform data that's uh, held in your uh, source data structure and re-express it uh, in the schema format uh, of the target uh, data structure, in our case an ontology. So what do you need to do, what do you need in order to do a mapping? The first thing you need to have is an understanding. An understanding of what? Uh, an understanding of two things. Uh, on the one hand, uh, you are translating a data structure into another data structure. The first thing you need to know is your own data, the data that you're going to translate. Uh, so. You need to look at uh, your data structure, whether it's an Excel spreadsheet uh, or a relational database or an XML document, and you have to look at how it's built and you have to understand what each field uh, was intended to do. So you have to uh, treat this information source as if it's making statements about the world, try to understand what does this document, what kinds of things does this document talk about and what each particular field is trying to say uh, about that kind of thing. Then, on the other hand, you need to know uh, the target uh, that you're trying to, the target structure you're trying to map to. So, in our case, an ontology. So, you need to choose an ontology that's appropriate uh, for your data, and you have to uh, study that ontology so you can understand how to use it properly. Uh, so, aside from knowledge, uh, you also need uh, some documents to start your mapping process. What are the documents you need? Well, for your source, uh, you need the actual file, if you can have it. Um, sometimes, uh, if you're working with a relational database, then the relational database uh, will have a description uh, of what each table and what each field means. So you can read that and try to understand what the creator of the uh, uh, schema was trying to uh, create these forms and these uh, tables for. Um, you really want a sample copy of the data uh, that you're translating because uh, there's often a divergence between uh, what uh, your database was designed for, or what your Excel was designed for, what your data structure was designed for, and how it was actually used. So sometimes a field has this title, but people fill in information, and they fill in completely different information. What you need to map in the end is not uh, your data structure, but the data values in your data structure. So you need both to look at the schema itself, but also the data that's held in the schema in order to do a good mapping. On the side of the ontology, the target data structure that you want to uh, map to, uh, you want to have uh, the specification document of the ontology that gives a description of what classes and properties are, the, are in the ontology and what they're used for. Uh, you want some sort of encoding of the ontology, so aside from having a PDF document or a Word document which describes uh, what uh, classes and properties are in the ontology, you have some way of encoding it. Usually an RDFS file or an OWL file, you'll need that eventually to do the translations, actual translations of data into the ontology format. 
so for CDOC CRM, you can find all those documents at cdoccrm.org. And finally, uh, to pull off your mapping, you'll need some tools. The first tools you're going to need uh, are pen and paper and time. Uh, so before you get into using any software to create the actual rules that will translate the data from uh, your source into the target, the first thing you're going to have to do is spend a lot of time thinking about your source information and your target and sketching out uh, potential solutions to what my data means when I translate it into the ontology. Spending time at that stage working with paper uh, is a lot more free and uh, investing that time then will make the actual uh, writing of the rules using a software considerably uh, more simple and efficient. After you've done your planning, you've done some modeling or mapping of the data uh, in your source to the target on paper, uh, then you would want to map in software. Uh, there's different products out there. Um, a well-known tool uh, from the States is called Karma. A well-known tool uh, from here in Crete is uh, called 3M, the Mapping Memory Manager. Uh, there are different solutions for different needs, uh, but uh, if we reference uh, something in this uh, talk, it'll be 3M, which you can find uh, an example of at this address. So, how do we actually, what is the method for doing a mapping? So the method for doing a mapping uh, is to start by looking at your source and uh, treat it as this document that's saying something about the world. And the first thing you want to ask uh, of your source schema is, what is this schema talking about in general? So what is the subject of the data structure? Is it talking about, is this table talking about people? Is it talking about documents? Is it talking about objects? Uh, that's uh, the number one thing that you want to find out. And then, once you've determined that, then you can treat every field within a table, or every column within uh, an Excel sheet, or every node within an XML uh, statement, uh, as being a particular statement uh, about that subject. So, uh, the documents have titles. Uh, people have names. If, a, if you have a name field, and you have a, uh, if you have a, an Excel for people, then the Excel is about people, and the name field says, this person has this name. So that sort of uh, analysis uh, is rather simple and intuitive to do, uh, and it will really help you re-express data in an ontology, because an ontology gives you something like a pidgin language uh, to express your data. So you can think of the natural language sentences that come out of, uh, of your source document, and write those down. Uh, and they'll give you a good first clue as to how you might want to start re-expressing your data in terms of the ontology. So, I recommend saying, look at the schema and say, what does this overall schema uh, talk about? So say, there is a person. There, every time you put data in this schema, it says, there is a person, there is a document, there is a building, whatever the schema is designed to say. And then for each field, um, the building is called, or the building was made at this time, whatever it be. So let's look at, it, at an example of that. Uh, this uh, is a simple schema uh, with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven fields. Uh, and it's expressed in Dublin Core, in fact. Uh, and uh, we have a data sample uh, here, so each field has uh, something filled in, so we know uh, what the person who uh, documented this uh, actually used the fields for. Uh, so, if I look at this uh, document, which in fact uh, is talking about the protocol of proceedings of the Crimea conference, uh, and I assume that this, is, this data sample is uh, replicated in other records in whatever uh, data source I have, then I can do an analysis and think about this and say, well, this whole uh, record uh, talks about documents. So the whole schema says, every time I enter in data for this thing, there is a document. And then very simply, if we go through, uh, the type field says the document has a type, the title field says the document has a title, the subtitle says the document has another title. Um, the date field, um, that's where you, so those are rather banal and easy to do. 
then when you get uh, a date, uh, then you have to start figuring out the semantics that are behind the field, because the date could be anything. The date could be when it was found, when it was stored, when whatever. Uh, you would have to look at the data and understand uh, the relation uh, between this and the document, but given general historical knowledge, we know that this is the date when this document was created. So this field is used to say, there is a, uh, the document came into existence at a date. Uh, the creator field says that the document was created by one or more people. Uh, it also has additional data because it says not only people, but what roles they played uh, at that time. Um, then we have the publisher, which says the document was published by some institution, and that the document and a subject field, uh, which says uh, what subject matter uh, this document is pert pertinent to. So that is uh, a, a simple example of how you might try and break down and understand uh, a, a schema uh, by looking at the, the fields and then understanding the values within them, testing a bunch of different sample records, and then coming up with the first draft understanding in natural language of what the schema is about. Then uh, you should look at your uh, ontology and uh, what are the questions that you want to ask of your target ontology? And what do you want to understand about it? Well, uh, things that, first you want to understand that the scope of the ontology, that is, what the ontology is supposed to cover, is relevant to your uh, domain of research. So you should look for that in the, in the specification document. Let's say that it is. Then, you want to understand the basic modeling strategy of the ontology, uh, which will probably be described in the preface, uh, and then you want to start looking at the top level classes of the ontology because an ontology is structured hierarchically with the most general terms, the most general classes at the top, and more specific data at the bottom. Uh, and what you have at the top of the ontology uh, is the most basic logic uh, and differentiations uh, which that ontology makes uh, in describing the world. So if you understand those top level concepts, then uh, you can find the right uh, part of the ontology to begin translating your information and then you can start and the logic that's expressed at the top will be repeated with more specificity lower down. So understanding the top you really start to understand the whole tree no matter how deep uh, the concepts get. So you should look at the top level classes and you should ask of those classes what kinds of things does this class allow me to talk about? Um, then not so what set of things in the world does it allow me to talk about? Does it let me talk about physical things? Does it let me talk about living things? What are the thing what is the class of things it allows me, the set of things that it allows me to describe? And then what does it allow me to say about that kind of thing? The question, what does it allow me to say that about that kind of thing is by looking at the properties that it has. So a class will say, this is used to describe these kinds of things, and then it will have properties. And so it will say, with this class, you can say that this thing has a name, that this thing has limbs, that this thing has. Uh, so you want to understand what the ontology uh, class is allowing you to say. Um, then you want to think back to your source and start trying to make the map in your head between uh, that, what is this schema about, and what does it say about the thing that it's about. Uh, and try and start making the connections between what the ontology allows you to express uh, and what you have in your source. Let's look a little bit of, at CDOC CRM as an example. Um, so CDOC CRM uh, is an ISO standard uh, ontology for cultural heritage, and uh, this is a, a standard representation of the basic modeling pattern of CDOC CRM. CDOC CRM has what's called an event-oriented modeling, uh, and the idea of an event-oriented modeling uh, is that uh, CDOC CRM wants to talk about uh, the human past, wants to allow us, re wants to give you an, a, the ability to express uh, general information about the human past. Uh, and so you'll often find in data systems that, the, uh, that we're very object-oriented and that we talk about this thing, this document, this building, this whatever. Uh, but all of those are pointing back to what we really want to talk about, which are the events that happened in the past uh, and how people and things uh, interacted in time and changed. So event-oriented modeling uh, has event classes in the middle, 
Um, so anything that has to do with time, uh, rather than being attached to an object, so that you say the document 1945, there's no, there's nothing essentially related between 1945 and a document. What you're really saying is that something happened in 1945 uh, and it created this document. So the event-oriented ontology always tries to pull out the event uh, that brought something to existence, changed it, uh, re-attributed it, these sorts of things. So here we're looking at a specific example of finding the logic behind uh, an ontology that you're mapping to. So CDOC CRM is event-oriented, it has an event in the middle, uh, events are the only thing that have time, events can take place at some uh, location, uh, and then the events involve uh, either physical things, as individual real physical objects, or concepts, which are things in our mind that can be expressed uh, in objects, uh, and uh, physical things can exist at locations at some time. Actors participate in events as agents, uh, and then everything on the, in the ontology uh, can be given as many names as we want. It's a basic feature of uh, how human beings uh, interact with the world, and it can be typed uh, as many times as you like. So that's, that's the sort of thing for whatever ontology you're mapping to. There's some sort of basic uh, modeling pattern uh, which you want to understand so you can begin to get the logic of how things are translated into uh, the new form. Then, again, uh, thinking back to the analysis of the top level of the ontology and using CDOC CRM as an example, uh, CDOC CRM the top level classes that are really of, are of importance, there's always one top level entity which is uh, where everything begins, so things that fall within our subject of discourse, but then we have a breaking down in, in CDOC CRM into temporal entities, persistent items, and places. That's a basic logical division between things, temporal entities are things that have uh, a real existence, uh, but they're uh, as opposed to a persistent item, uh, which has persistent I identity over time. So as I move through this video, uh, even though uh, I, uh, what you may, may or may not see my arm, I have one physical identity which will be uh, true throughout all these events. Whereas the actual video event, if you were to cut it into pieces, the different pieces don't give you the whole identity of the video, only uh, watching the whole thing uh, will give you the identity. So, they have temporal, temporal entities, they have time, persistent items, they participate in time, and we have E53 place, uh, which is uh, a construct for describing location in a purely mathematical form. So, when you say something has a place, you're saying it existed in a geometry at some time. Uh, so, totally non-romantic, but it has a function in the ontology to say this is where something was. <laughs> Uh, and persistent items furthermore break down into physical things which have one, uh, one material existence uh, in time and once you smash it up it is uniquely gone and it's destroyed as opposed to a conceptual object uh, which once I think it up um, continues to exist uh, so long as I remember it or somebody else remembers it or it's written down somewhere so uh, I come up you can think about lost poems. We know that there's a Sappho poem about X, Y, or Z, uh, and uh, now maybe we only have the the uh, the name of it. So it was a conceptual object that once existed that's now gone, but it existed so long as it was written down somewhere or somebody remembered it, and it can exist in multiple places. So I can know it, and you can know it, and it can be written in five thousand books. Uh, and finally, uh, the notion of E39 actor, uh, which talks about uh, things uh, or well entities that have, can have an agential purpose in the world, so they can cause things to happen. So that's the top level of CDOC CRM, and you want to do that sort of analysis on whatever ontology uh, you are adopting, uh, so that you could uh, begin your translations. And then what you do when you're uh, trying to map uh, from your source into the ontology is you find you start, you've already done the work of analyzing your source and saying uh, this uh, schema talks about this kind of thing and then you've done your analysis of your uh, target ontology and you say it allows me to talk about these major categories of things uh, and then you want to pick a path down into the ontology
ontology uh, and do what I call the ontological limbo. Uh, essentially, you figure out what part of the ontology I should be trying to map to, and then you start, the ontology is structured hierarchically like a tree, and so you start parsing down into the ontology, using the document to understand the subclass and the superclass, and you say, how far down can I go in this, in, in this branch of the ontology to get close to the kinds of things that I want to talk about and uh, to find the class that gives me all the properties to allow, to allow me to re-express whatever my source says using ontology. So uh, you, for example, find that what I'm talking about is a temporal thing. So you start with temporal entity, and then you look and you say temporal entity has a subclass period. Okay, is period good enough for me? You look at the property, you look at the, uh, the scope note, you see if that's correct. You look at the properties, you see if it gives you enough properties to describe your object. And if not, you go down another step uh, and you check out what event would do for you. Um, so the highest classes are the most abstract uh, and they're the least likely uh, to be the ones uh, that you want to map to, but the, the, the starting point to find out where you should map to in the ontology then you start going down, and uh, you keep on going down uh, until uh, hopefully you find a class that's expressive enough uh, for you to map your data. So, just to give an example of that uh, process very briefly in relation to uh, our example from here, where we did uh, this uh, thinking about the Crimea conference uh, documented using uh, Dublin Core, and we did this mapping saying that it's about, this schema is about documents like the Crimea Conference Proceedings. So, if that was my target, uh, and I was using C.CRM, then I could start with the very top of C.CRM, which we saw here is E1 Entity, and uh, I would say, okay, can I map uh, my schema, what it's about, to the class E1 so then I would go and I would look at the class uh, scope note, which says this, compri this class comprises all things in the universe of discourse of the CDOC conceptual reference model. The universe of discourse of the CDOC conceptual reference model is cultural heritage. Is the Crimea conference cultural heritage? Sure it is. So, is this class appropriate? Yes, it is. Fine. So I could potentially map uh, the, my, my schema to E1. Then the next thing I want to do is look at the relations, the properties, uh, those are interchangeable words for the same thing, uh, that this class has to see if it gives me enough expressivity to re-say what, what I have in the source document in the ontology. So this class, E1 Entity, allows me to say, uh, has a property that says P1 is identified by and points to a class for documenting names. P2 has type, which points to a class about types, and P3 has no and it points to a class that describes strings. So, what I have in my source document, uh, I have something about types, I have something about titles, so I'm going pretty strong just with E1 already, but then I have something about a date, and I have something about people, and I have something about other institutions, and I have something about subject matter. So if I go back to E1, and I consider that class as a candidate for mapping to. Uh, is, it, is it enough for me? It's not. It's not semantically rich enough to re-describe the data structure. So that's not surprising at the top level of the ontology. So I go further down. And so I can think about, this is a negative example. So is um, my uh, schema about the, that has the Crimea conference as an example, is it an instance of, uh, does it talk about temporal entities? Well, no, the uh, Crimea conference documents is not uh, a temporal entity. Uh, it's one thing that's uh, continuous through, has a continuous identity through time. Its relation to time is that it occurred in relationship to an event. So I wouldn't want to map it with uh, E2, so I can toss that. Uh, and then, so we're looking here at these uh, top level things. So E1, is it an E2? No. Uh, then we can use some basic logic. Is it geometric space? No, it's not. So, uh, by process of elimination, is it uh, a persistent item? Uh, well, persistent item is cl this class comprised items that have a persistent identity, sometimes known as endurance in philosophy, 
They can be repeatedly recognized within the duration of their existence by identity criteria rather than by continuity or observation. So, uh, that's just to say uh, that if I look at it again through time, it'll be the same thing recognizable by some uh, characteristics, like the document will have the same words in it or the same conceptual uh, reference. So, it is an E77. Uh, and I would keep on going down, doing this limbo, uh, until I found uh, the appropriate uh, class uh, to map it with. So, uh, we're going to look at uh, actually mapping that thing as, a, as our final example. Um, but before we do that, just to say, how do you know how far you should go down in this ontological limbo? Well, I always check the scope note. It's also known as the intention with an S. Uh, which describes what the class is supposed to be used for. Always check the properties or relations of the class to see if they give you a, enough uh, properties to be able to describe whatever you have in the source. And you can always go a little further. So if you find, for example, I just now discovered that it's not only an E1, uh, but it's an E77, you just keep on going down below E77 and say, what's the next step and is that still descriptive or have I gone too far? So, let me give you a um, mapping re recipe and then give you an example. So the basic ma ma mapping recipe is determine for the whole data structure what class uh, describes it in the target ontology. So that's going to be your subject. And if, we, if you've looked at other videos about the, the ontology, you'll realize that all uh, information is expressed in an ontology through subject verb object relations, simple sentences. So, find your subject. Then for each field, uh, so going back to our example, so the whole thing, find its subjects. Then for each field, uh, try and figure out what class that field would ma map to in the ontology. That would be your object. Uh, and then you have to, the game is to find the relations that will connect uh, your subject with your object, which are not necessarily just one. So you might, if you have a simple uh, thing that you want to express, like uh, this thing has a title, then the relationship in the uh, original schema is probably thing, title, title. Uh, and in the ontology, it's also uh, that the E77 P1 has appellation and appellation. So you've got a one-to-one -one mapping. But sometimes in the, in the ontology, you're going to have to take several steps through multiple relations and classes to say the same thing uh, because you're going to be say, saying it in a more explicit and more rich way. So you do that, uh, you take each uh, uh, field as an object and you connect it back to the subject and when you've done that, you've created a mapping. So, uh, some tips on um, uh, mapping and what it is not. So mapping is not matching terms for terms. So if you look at your source data structure and a field has a certain label, and you find in your target ontology that a class has a certain label, uh, you should not be uh, duped into thinking that this is necessarily the best class to re-describe your information. So you understand uh, if you should use a class, never use just the label, but you can use it as an indicator and you can go and look at the ontology and say, is their meaning of title the same as I, my meaning of title? But the only way to know for sure is to understand your source personally, what your, 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 your source document really is trying to say, and then you read the ontology description, the scope note of the class, to understand if you should really translate uh, that information with that class. Another thing is that mapping is not tagging, uh, so it's not sufficient just to say, uh, my schema uh, is described by this class, and each field is described by this class, that class, and the other class. That would be a process of tagging, but uh, the value of semantic data uh, comes through uh, fully when you take, uh, when you express really what the original source document was trying to say using this new uh, uh, ontological language. So you not only say, my source schema, uh, each time I have an instance of it, it's talking about a document, but furthermore, if it says uh, that it has a title, then the title maps to Appalachian, say in CDOC CRM, but the interesting information is that I say that this document has the property that it has this title. That sort of thing can be built on uh, as a network of information. You can find out 
who gave it the title, when it got the title, and so on and so forth. So without that uh, drawing of the semantic connections between the classes in the ontology, you don't get all the benefit of uh, mapping. So that's what mapping is, translating a data structure into formal propositions using a pidgin language. So let's do an example uh, based uh, on uh, this idea of the uh, Crimea conference uh, as documented with Dublin Core. So if this is a good uh, sample data uh, of this schema, uh, these fields here, then I can say that this overall schema is mapped in CDOC CRM by a conceptual object. Uh, so a document is not really a thing, it's a concept uh, that's been drawn up. So the proceedings of the Crimea was the document that described the division of Europe in the post -World, uh, World War II period. So uh, in the hierarchy of CDOC CRM, underneath the conceptual object, there's an idea of a document, which is something which uh, describes the state of affairs at a certain point in time. So that's the best class for describing the overall uh, schema. Uh, and then I would look for uh, the object uh, that each field describes. So a type, there is in fact in CDOC CRM a class called type and is appropriate for types. So E55 type would be a good translation. Titles uh, in CDOC CRM are translated as E41 appellation. Uh, so both title and subtitle can be uh, mapped to the same class. A date uh, is translated in CDOC CRM by a time span, so it gives a, a start and an end period. Uh, people uh, are translated in CDOC CRM as E21 persons, that's a subclass of uh, actor, E39 actor. E40, uh, is legal body, uh, describes institutions, it's also a subclass of actor. And then a subject matter is again a sort of uh, typology, so we can translate it as E55 type. So that's an example of uh, me having done uh, the mapping of the subject of the overall schema and then uh, the object uh, which each field describes. And then the game uh, is to make these semantic connections. So uh, there uh, you would go through uh, in the documentation of CDOC CRM or whatever, whatever ontology you're looking at and you would find uh, the properties, sorry, that would connect, say, E31 document to type, to appellation, to time span, and so on and so forth. So uh, let's just walk through that one by one. Um, so we can start with the uh, type. So uh, as we saw uh, a few slides earlier, uh, everything in the CDOC CRM falls underneath the class E1 CRM entity. And E1 CRM entity has the properties, uh, P1 has appellation, and P2 has type. So that means that every other class is a subclass of E1 CRM entity, and it means it also has those properties. So I can use has type on E31, and that would be a great way, if I read the scope note, it says uh, P2 has type means that this thing is classified by that thing. So is that a good semantic translation of uh, this field? Sure is. So, E31 document has type, what kind of type? Text, that's the actual data value. Then we want to talk about the title. So, uh, again, E1 uh, says that everything can have a name, and that uh, name relation is, is identified by. So I can use that property to connect my uh, protocol, proceedings of Crimea conference information. I say the title is an E41 and it's connected to the document as being an identifier for it. So, if we went into the temporal entities uh, 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 class hierarchy and started doing this limbo, you can do it yourself, uh, then eventually you'll find uh, a class called E65 creation, uh, the point of which is to document uh, moments in time in which new conceptual, uh, or item, conceptual items come to be in the world. So, in this case, it was February 11th, 1945, was the time span in which uh, the document, which is the protocol of proceedings, uh, was created. So you can see that the mapping then, here is a simple one-to-one -one mapping. So this overall schema says that the, this thing has a type. So this document has a type. Sometimes it's more complex, like when we're talking about time, where we have two steps where we say, this document was created by an event, that event had a time. Uh, then. You start getting 
by doing that, you start being able to develop more rich and more accurate uh, data structures. So, uh, when we say that a document had a creator, or we link it to a person, well, there could be many relations, relationships between uh, a person and a document. It could be the person documented by the document. It could be the person who published the document, and so on and so forth. So, bringing out something like an event class allows you to be more specific about what you mean the relationship is between a document uh, and uh, a person. So, uh, as you'll remember from looking at the schema of modeling in CDOC CRM, uh, people uh, are agents in events. Uh, so in this case, uh, we could map, for example, that the creator uh, is the person who carried out the event of creation of the signing of the protocols that generated this document. So we would map this creator thing, not directly onto the document, but onto the creation event, and we would say, this creation event was carried out by Stalin, was carried out by Churchill, was carried out by uh, Roosevelt. Uh, then uh, we can do even uh, fancier tricks. Uh, so sometimes you can have uh, roles, for example. So uh, here uh, the documents uh, missed out the facts of the actual person and just put in the role. So now we could put, we could be much more semantically explicit and we could map out uh, the roles and say that uh, the uh, protocols of proceeding on Crimea were created by a creation event, it was carried out by Joseph Stalin in his capacity as Premier of the U, uh, USSR. Uh, and that's very explicit. Uh, and then uh, I'll skip over publisher for uh, lack of space on the slide. Uh, the last thing uh, we can do is uh, look at this mapping uh, between uh, the document and uh, this notion of the subject post-war division of Europe and Japan. So here you'll see that we have we have the document, the overall schema talks about a document, uh, and then we have a relationship to a type. We say that this document can be classified as a text. Uh, but then we have another, uh, this thing we mapped as a type, the subject is a type, but the relationship is different. So we're saying we find a property that says documents can say something about the world and they can say about it in a typological way. We can say, this document is about post-war Europe, and that's semantically distinct from saying I've classified this document as being of the kind text. Uh, so, that is bringing us to a conclusion uh, of our short look at mapping today. Um, and I just wanted to bring it back to that initial thought exercise that we did of being very explicit of analyzing the source. Uh, so, um, we have here, uh, we can take this schema and the, and the sample values uh, and we can say the overall thing uh, has uh, this, it maps to this class and then we create a series of paths uh, that map this field into an ontological expression. So title becomes E31 is identified by appellation, date becomes E31 document, P94 was created by E65, E65 creation, P4 has time span, E52 time span, and then the actual date would be a value in here, and so on and so forth. So I hope that was an interesting and useful uh, analysis of how to uh, perform a mapping. Uh, you can find uh, further information about uh, CDOC CRM uh, mapping at cdoccrm.org, uh, and uh, there's my contact.